All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our investment strategy and market update. Um, as always, I'm joined by Kenneth Beanland. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Um, today, uh, just as per our usual updates, we're going through reporting season, um, to see what the, the, um, you know, the, the outcomes of some of those, mm -hmm. those, those uh, reports. Uh, interest rates, as always, and how they impact some property as well. So update on that. Australian and global economy. Um, the US election, which is uh, everywhere at the moment, uh, but particularly also uh, for our economy, the com commodity and energy market and see how that looks. A bit of a strategy update where we see things going forward. Um, and we also get to test um, how you went last reporting <laughs> season as well. So um, other than that, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Kenneth. Sounds great. Usual uh, <clears throat> disclaimer, uh, general advice, but... Um, uh, why don't we get things moving? Uh, we always like to start with a high-level overview. Yep. And I think this this time around has been a little bit different from that February-March period. We are at really elevated levels in terms of <clears throat> uh, the multiple in which uh, we, we, we moved into reporting season. Um, so what we like to do here is strip out uh, commodities and energy, they distort the multiple. Um, and so we, we're sitting at around about 20 times forward earnings per share. That's expensive relative to where we would um, have historically seen it over the last few years. I think there is some, uh, some, some cautious data. Uh, and you can see here to the, to the left-hand side, we actually had some significant misses uh, in terms of both outside of the large cap space and in the big end of town. So 31% actually missed expectations um, and then very, very close to 30% on the X50 as well. And you can see there that if you tie those two together, it, it, it does set it up for a little bit of a cautious next six to 12 months in our opinion. Um, what happened uh, with those beats and misses? So what was the price action? On the, on the left-hand side there, you can see that uh, the... <laughs> The, the beats, particularly when we did see a, uh, a, a reasonable result, it was a really strong price reaction. But if you tie that in with not many were actually beating, we only had 21%, it felt like the market was sort of chasing those, 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 those great returns. So we saw those big uplifts in terms of the price on the initial day, um, but it's actually inflated compared to what we saw with those earnings per share changes. So just keep that in mind as we start to roll through this. Conversely, <coughs> misses were punished, um, both in terms of initial price reaction, the, the overall change in terms of the FY 2025 and FY 26 um, EPS changes were, was quite dramatic as well. You can see that on the, on the right-hand side. Um, so overall at a top line, we thought it was, it was an okay period, but it certainly wasn't as strong as what we have previously seen. Um, this actually then flows through into, well, what was management saying? Um, I think this is a great sentiment tracker that uh, our, um, our friends at <coughs> uh, Morgans have been able to uh, provide. Um, basically, what this is showing is what, what was management's commentary around challenging conditions, around improving conditions, around inflation. Um, there's probably, I suppose, four main areas that I would focus on. One you can see that really over this from August 22 right the way through to August 24, we've seen a reduction in people talking about inflation. It's starting to get under control. On the flip side, we've had a big, big increase in, 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 in management's commentary at least around challenging trading conditions from February to now. And so that's that final two columns when you look at that challenging conditions um, uh, section of that graph on the right-hand side. Um, obviously, the inverse of that, we've had a big drop-off in the improving conditions. Um, and the other thing that I think was is to note, um, because we haven't seen these sorts of numbers flow through into unemployment or anything yet, um, but cost cutting. You can see at the very far far right there um, of, the, of the graph on the left-hand side, um, cost cutting is now starting to be a really big focus, as it was in that at that back end of twenty two and twenty three. Um, we're now in a position, and and it does flow through with that inflation discussion, where 
it does seem like there's there's the rhetoric around high inflation is starting to change. And what that means is as interest rates have already started cutting globally, um, we certainly haven't yet, but in, we're just talking in general terms, that as interest rates start to fall off, we're starting to see that growth trade reignite. And by growth, I mean higher growth companies. So I just pick on NextDC or CSL, some of those healthcare stocks uh, in the big end of town. Um, and then you've got some smaller ones like ProMedicus or, or Nanosonics, um, ones where we're talking around future cash flows being a long way into the future. Yeah. When you're discounting those back at a lower rate, um, it makes it look better than, than if you were with a higher rate. Uh, and so we have seen cyclicals take a hammering through that period. But on the flip side, we saw the growth end of town really start to pick up. And we think that's predicated on the fact that the, all of those interest rate expectations starting to normalise and even decrease. With those expectations, I know that um, being, you know, on these sort of presentations with you historically, mm -hmm. you sort of uh, had a view that we're about six months behind mm -hmm. the US. That's still in alignment? Well, look, we believe so. Yeah. Uh, we saw the US Federal Reserve this month cut interest rates by 50 basis points. Yep. So we're not saying that in six months' time directly we're going to have a 50 no. basis point cut. Sure. But and, and from in another two slides we'll actually go through this. You can see where markets have started to price our first initial cut. And that sits at around about that February, March. So if you go six months from here... That's kind of that kind of aligns. Uh, now we're 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 still, uh, you know, of the belief that how we dealt with COVID was different. We've come out different at different times, um, and we are around that six month lag in terms of, uh, or, you know, economic growth and interest rates. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think finally, this is this this is a, a really important um, graph uh, or, or slide. Um, we did see our top line of our of, of our market at least hold up, and we have actually in, increased in value a little bit since then. Um, but to the right hand side, you can see that for you know, the larger the mid caps, and that's where we spend most of our time looking at, um, we saw some reasonable reactions. So those those prices actually lifted. But the flip side to that was we actually saw EPS, so earnings per share growth, be revised negative. And at some point that has to give either the, the revisions to earnings have to increase substantially or the prices have to come down. It doesn't work both ways. And we, we're going back to that growth trade with those inflation numbers and, and the easing sort of environment, you do see those multiples start to expand a little bit. We really have to be focused on, on that earnings per share because at the end of the day, that's what's going to drive share markets over the long term. So just to recap on that, just for the for the viewers or listeners, what you're really saying there is that at the moment where valuations sit, either we need to see an improvement in our earnings or valuations are going to potentially soften. Potentially soften. Yep. Um, they can't keep going up forever without those earnings back behind them. Yeah. Um, on to interest rates and uh, Australia's favourite price time anyway, Australian property. Um, so this is just a, a, a graph uh, we'll both grasp one for the Fed and one for the RBA. We do tend to focus on these, particularly the US, as it's a bellwether um, uh, interest rate um, for for the globe and for the world. Um, so you can see there that uh, we've, we've, we are in a softening environment. We've seen that first 50 basis point cut. Um, there's another two priced in for the end of the year. I think it'll be interesting to see if that happens, but we're not so concerned over you know if it's another 25 or another 50 it's the general theme of where we're going um, and you can see there that it is starting to soften as we move through and 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 the expectation right now at least is for around about that 2.8 percent at the end of uh, calendar year 25. <clears throat> um, for us it is a little different we don't have that initial drop as you can see there right up until that february march period where it does start to soften off um, and we, we'll go through this in later detail, but the unemployment rate has started to, to shift from lows. We have seen some significant softening within the trimmed mean. Um, we're trying to exclude those um, <laughs> volatile rebates that we saw uh, for the government, which put the headline uh, right down. Um, but the expectation, at least for markets, is that that general trend is softening through to the end of uh, 25, and we're going to sit at around about that 3.25%. Onto Australian property. 
Um, this, over the last year, has probably been the first time that we've really seen a change in sort of market conditions where there has been some really strong areas. And then conversely, we've had a slowdown. In, in, and one really surprisingly to me was, uh, was the Melbourne CBD area um, that has actually gone slightly backwards over 12 months. Um, but really strong areas in Brisbane, Perth and Adelaide. Um, but what happens when, when interest rates start to, start to fall? It's actually a really good time for, for, for leveraged assets. Property is a leveraged asset. Um, when, when, you know, I, I thought this was an, um, a very interesting graph that, that came out of Macquarie where even in a slowdown environment and we do see that tightening or easing, we, we have traditionally had some significant increases to property prices. Um, and so that's sort of predicating where we believe at least the economy is going. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of talk right now around changes in legislation, politics is coming into the floor. Um, look, we, we always, no matter what environment you're in for, for, for assets, you work within the bounds, but don't make them stop you from your strategic asset allocation decisions. I think it's really important to stick on that plan, whatever that case may be. Um, and so while you, you, might, you might have the goalpost change, you still want to play the game. On to the Australian and global economy. Uh, this just shows you what, what has happened over 23 and 24 and then, ex and then the expectations for uh, 25 uh, for some of the major areas in, in, in the world. Um, I think that the general trend, um, and, and you can look through this, we'll send this out to um, uh, whoever, whoever wants it, uh, is that we are still seeing that softening between 24 and 25 outside of a, outside of a bright spot, which is us. Um, where we have had a significant um, moderation in growth through 24, we're at about 1.7%. Um, the, the last two readings were 0.1 and 0.3 uh, in terms of GDP. So um, that we're hoping <laughs> does mean that we're at, we're at the back end of the slowdown and we need to see a bit of a moderation there and hopefully an uplift into that 2025, which is, um, uh, I suppose, base case um, for us. Um, the other thing to note, again, is that consistent trend in CPI, which is in the bottom part, um, so consumer price inflation. Um, you can see there that 2023 outside of uh, China, um, for similar reasons around COVID and how to deal with that, we are still seeing that softening right the way through, um, again, outside of Australia. So we think that when you look at the, the top line, right now we're, we're, we're definitely benefiting from the... <clears throat> Uh, electricity rebates that have come through, they'll roll off. And so you'll have to see that uplift um, as you come back through into 25. But um, the general trend is they're going down. Um, global interest rates have already started um, to be cut. We think this is an interesting time as we um, move into the back end of uh, 24. The, 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 the rhetoric around inflation has certainly died off. What we're now changed to is unemployment. So you, you, you're starting to hear about the SARM rule and, and you know, people, people are pointing to the uplift in, in, in unemployment and, and what that means. Um, really, uh, and, and you can only take it with a grain of salt because there's not that many times in terms of actual um, data points that you can point to that the SARM rule basically says that if you've had a, a, a reasonable increase, so half a percent increase um, in unemployment from, tr from trough to peak, uh, the immediate uh, 12 months after that, the US economy goes into a recession every time. Um, but we've done a little bit of digging and we think that, look, yes, there has been that uptick and that's going to dominate headlines. So we think far more than inflation as in, towards the back end. Um, but the, the, the employment ratio has gone up. The layoffs are actually still at very, very low levels, sort of historically low levels. So is it really as bad as it seems? Um, we, we don't think so. We think that um, when we're looking at the US economy, and this is, this is predicated on the US economy, this, this particular slide, um, their economy isn't going or doesn't at least exhibit signs of a hard landing just yet. Um, and by a hard landing recession, a, a, a severe recession. Almost the exact same um, position here is the Australian unemployment. Um, we have, even though we're still sitting in around about that 4.2%, that 
if you if you went through with that SARM rule, you would actually see cutting right now. Um, we think it's a really interesting time for the Australian um, uh, employment market. Um, we have had significant population increase. Um, so anticipation rates are starting to go up and we still remain pretty steady at around you know, that 4.2. Yes, we've, we've, everyone's lifted off those lows, um, but the, the, the recent print, at least, we actually saw expectations for that rate cut pushed, pushed further away. Um, so while historically you would have seen rate cuts potentially start to come through now, we still think that it's going to be in that, in that February, March, April period next year. Um, this is a really important area for investors, in our opinion. Um, this currency is notoriously difficult uh, to forecast on short term, so we take a longer term approach. And you can see there that outside of a few pressure points over the last 20 years, the Australian dollar is actually at a low point in terms of its cycle. So we've sort of been sitting at around about those low 60s almost all the way through this year. Now, with our interest rate environment remaining steady, the US in, in interest rate environment falling back, we've got a far greater um, or a, a much better federal budget. Their deficit is a lot larger. And we think that if, if there is some Chinese stimulus or continued Chinese stimulus, that this all points to a rising Australian dollar. Now, that's not just us. We've put uh, a Bloomberg consensus forecast up there as well. And we've also put a Morgan's uh, forecast up there as well. Um, we think that those low to mid 70s is very much achievable. Um, and I think that if you think around longer term and the drivers behind our sort of inflation relative to uh, uh, over, overseas, we think that there's going to be upward pressure um, for, for an extended period of time. So how do we deal with that? Well, we try and hedge where appropriate. That means that you're, you're not taking currency risk if you're holding international markets. You have to pay a little bit for that in terms of products, um, but we think that as, as, as and, uh, we've been lucky enough to ride almost all the way through that, that 2010 to 2020 period um, where as the currency falls, you're getting a, a, a currency tailwind that's about to reverse. So this is, a, this is a, in our opinion, a very, very important graph for the next six to 12 months. Um, we're getting a lot of calls on this, like all the time. And so we thought it, would, it was appropriate to just show some, show some data to people, make sure that um, our, our, our views at least are conveyed on, on what elections mean for markets and what to expect over the, the next six to 12 months. Um, sure. There's, there's probably going to be a lot of headlines and there's going to be a lot of short-term volatility. Um, we've seen this before with, with Trump. 2016, the, the 20 to 24 to 48 hours where it was unexpected that he was going to get in and then it turned around, he was going to get in. We saw the US um, futures index down 6 7%. It ended up positive 4 6% within 48 hours and then it powered on. What we're telling people is that, yes, it's going to drive headlines, but in the long term, it makes absolutely no difference to what you should expect over your long-term performance. Um, and we've got some data to back it up from Morgan Stanley, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just so everyone can see. Um, I, think, I think every single time there has been um, you know, a, a major conflict, uh, you know, in World War II, global financial crises, um, COVIDs, these things happen, but they are inbuilt into long-term expectations. And the trick is that you need to step back, make sure that you've got a long-term focus if you're in long-term appreciating assets, uh, such as shares, such as property, and just ride through those cycles. Strategic asset allocation will drive your returns. Um, so just, a, just a, a, a quick overview, in all election years, all of them, we've seen an average of around about 11.3% in the US. Um, that's pretty strong, in my opinion. That's a, that's a good year. Uh, and so, and then and that's, there's significant data points there. So we can point to all of them over, over onto the right-hand side and just take the average of those. Um, and there's, there's, there's other areas where you've seen either some bigger ones or some, or some, you know, some 
some weaker ones, but you've got to take the average. Um, I think the, the, the case that I would I would make right now is you have a look at what happened with Trump in 2016. I think there's a far greater acceptance that he may get in this time. And so I think actually you'll see less volatility because of that. Um, but even when he came in, there was a 12% return. And then post that, because of the tax cuts, because of the pro-cyclical um, business uh, type environment that he created, um, the US actually outperformed. Um, so look, times were different back then, valuations were different back then, but I think it's just a, a really important to say, yes, you're gonna hear about it, but no, don't make any major decisions around, around your long-term focus um, for assets. Um, one graph that we've we've used before um, is around the AMP climbing the wall of worry. And if you haven't seen it, please reach out. We'll send it through. But this is a similar graph. Um, geopol geopolitical uh, shocks, um, very, very um, front of mind right now, happen. They happen a lot. Um, and some are really, really bad. But this just shows that if you, if you were to jump at shadows or, or jump at, not shadows, or jump at these events, um, and try and time, um, we think it would be detrimental uh, to your overall return period. So all of these are real events and all the way through from basically 1930, it is the slow and steady accumulation throughout that time and holding those assets that would, you would have achieved those long-term returns. And I think the key to that is, is, is you know, there's going to be periods of volatility and it's just coming back to the same same story. It's quality assets in your asset strategic asset allocation. Completely agree. Yeah. Um, very topical right now is commodity and energy markets for, for us, us Australian investors in particular. Um, we do have a significant exposure to materials in our in our index. We also have significant exposure to, to energy in our index. Um, look, we we believe we're at a low point in the cycle uh, for and, and we'll start with energy. Um, for LNG, for, for Brent. Um, and look, we do predicate this on a few things. One, clearly as global growth, it, it starts to fall down. Um, and you do see a selling off of, of, of cyclicals. Um, but on the flip side, we are starting to see that weakening of the US dollar. And we think that and the, the Chinese economy in particular, if, if there is some stimulus and, and looks like there has been over the last 24 to 48 hours, um, that's a really positive sign for commodities and energy. Um, we would point to a couple of graphs that we think that do do, do back that up. Um, so the bottom right there, all we're showing is the US federal funds rate, so the interest rate over in the US. Um, as that falls off, <clears throat> what happens to, to, to energy markets? Um, 08, 09, you see that really big drop down, you see global growth start to spur off and you see a really big increase into that, uh, into the oil price. Um, we think that, that that Fed fund rate is starting to go down and there's a lagging event. But in 20, 2019, 2021, we saw the same thing. Um, we saw oil spike up again. Um, so we think that it is uh, conducive to energy um, and still maintain exposure there. Probably just on that, you, you mentioned the um, there's been some recent aggressive um, stimulus policy mm. from China. The impact on that, on the, you know, a bit more details on the commodity prices here? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, we've, we've seen, a, you know, for a long time, a sort of soft-handed approach with Chinese stimulus, and we've seen a weaker and weaker commodity complex. So iron ore would be the major one for, for everyone to look at, but, but copper as well. Um, now, if there is a real focus from the Chinese government to, to prop up their economy, we think it's going to be very, very, and, and <laughs> very favourable for iron ore and copper markets. Um, they're the major, major um, uh, pro producers of it, but manufacturers of steel, um, and then they are the consumer of it as well. And so we're going to see, we've seen a nice little uplift over the last couple of days. Um, and I'll just point to the BHPs and the Rios. Um, I think, you know, what you've got to be cautious of is balance sheets around this time, because if it, if, if, if it is another flash in the pan and they don't, they don't continue on with it um, and, and prices drop, you want to make sure that you are in those quality assets that can ride through those cycles. Um, onto this. 
Um, so you can see here we've we've just made some general comments. Um, I think first first off, gold has been a fantastic uh, commodity to have exposure to, um, either via physical or the, or the gold miners. Um, it's it's risen at such a rapid rate this year that we're actually expecting a short term pullback. Um, but the longer term tailwinds for gold we think are in place. Um, so really, really large deficits, um, really, really big expansion of money supplies. Uh, and so we think that that, that, that price, while, while short term you're going to see some volatility, will continue to attract attention. Um, copper, I think, has been an, an interesting one and, and something that has caught my attention at least. Um, for the last two years, you hear around the electrification of the world. Yep. You've got uh, electric cars coming through requiring more copper. Um, but we've seen a, a pretty reasonable softening of that copper price um, and, and haven't really seen it spur on um, for a good few years now. And so we're still long-term believers. Um, Dr. Copper is what it's affectionately known as. If, if, if the global economy is starting to slow, it falls down. Um, so we're, 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 we're quietly optimistic on the long-term expectations because of those, you know, I think, fundamental drivers around climate change and, and, and the usage of copper. Um, but just right now, we think that there's, there's, there's going to be a little bit more of a, a, a pullback. Um, to your point with iron ore, though, we've made some comments from the Chinese steel industry. Uh, this came out about a couple of months ago. And, and you know, in and by itself, uh, you would go, oh, yes or no. But this is actually being backed up by BHP. We, we are starting to see um, some of those majors expect lower for longer iron ore markets. Yep. Um, so how do you deal with that? You make sure that you're in the lowest cost quartile, so BHP and Rio. Um, you're not getting any significant discounts um, to your, your, your high-grade iron ore. So if you look at some, some of the complex that uh, Fortescue has, they, they actually have wide discounts on their, on their iron ore. And then I think just as importantly, if BHP is saying it and the Chinese industry is saying it, it's being fed through into analyst expectations. And so when you're looking at these prices of, of these types of companies, they're based off those analyst forecasts. And, and they're in a, we're already seeing significantly lower prices priced in. Um, we're starting to see, well, potentially at least, um, some value emerge in, in a couple of those nodes. So the um, analysts winding back the, their valuations for mm -hmm. iron ore. Are we seeing anything from the, the actual miners themselves within the dividend payouts or capital management programs? Yeah, that's, I'll, that's forecasting I'll certainly touch on, um, uh, touch on the general commodities theme through FY25 and beyond yep. um, because there's a great graph in there that shows you those oh, well, it's earnings per share changes. Uh, we saw some weaker dividends uh, flow through from BHP. Um, there's, uh, I think, you know, it's just an input, right? You go from $200 US a tonne, which has never been seen before, to a more normalised market. And I say normalised, but really uh, over $100 a tonne for the last 10 years is actually really, really good. Um, you're going to see some some earnings per share downgrades. That's what's, that's what's going to happen. Um, you've got to be very, very careful and very, very cautious if you're expecting dividends over an extended period of time for something that is cyclical. Um, they're not they're not price setters, they're price takers. So onto onto the outlook. Uh, and I think I think we've we've got to start by saying that with consensus expectations around an easing cycle, and easing cycle means interest rates starting to drop off. Out and 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 also predicating that by saying we don't think there's there's an imminent hard recession. What does that mean for, for equity markets? Well, we think it's historically been pretty good, at least over the the first you know six to six to um, nine months where you see that initial cut. Um, and so to the left hand side there, if we're right, and we'll, we'll touch on an economic surprise index um, to the right soon, um, if if the US doesn't go in to a to a, a you know a hard landing, it's actually really it's been a really positive time for equity markets. Um, so that's that light blue line there. If we do, if we do end up in a in a in a US recession, yes, it's been reasonably poor. So you end up around about a negative four percent, but that's not the end of the world either. Um, we think that the US is going to continue to meander through, and I think that US economic surprise index shows a really good reason why we're, we're actually starting to see an uptick 
in the surprise index. That means that the data is being starting to trough and the data is starting to get better. Um, this was the graph that I was talking about. Uh, and I think this just really, really shows you know, uh, the, how the Australian stock market has changed a little bit. We've got the major banks now dominating in terms of the overall percentage of the index. We've seen 3% earnings upgrades, which means that's positive, but you've got to tie that back in with valuations. That was actually where was one of my questions for you today was, We've seen such a run on those mm. on the banks of recent times and evaluations, and we're looking into a tougher period ahead. Mm. Um, yeah, the probably and probably the uh, the analyst reports coming out of that too is also with a negative view on valuations. Mm. Where do we see that from here? So, so we're of the same opinion. Um, we think that you know the the earnings upgrades have occurred, but we're still seeing flat. To really negative earnings for the next 24 months for some of these banks. They're at three standard deviations above their long-term averages for what you're paying for them. So that means that if you had 100, 100 opportunities to buy banks, you're picking the, the, the very first percentile in terms of how expensive they are. So they're expensive. They're expensive to long and short term, and they're expensive to that's sorry, long and short term multiples. Um, they're expensive to almost consensus or every single consensus valuation there are. Um, but it has been the bright spot when you think around our index, because as China's peeled off, we've seen resources as energy really start to to fall over. That's the other area that the international investors really like to come into our markets for. So we think there's been a big uplift in terms of international ownership of our banks. That will start to change. And I think it will start to change really, really quickly if we do see a big uplift in the Chinese economy. And so you'll start to see that switch between banks Back into, into commodities. those. Correct. Yep. Correct. Um, put that in context. Where, where's the, um, the, the current uh, P ratios for those banks versus their their normalised. Yes, yeah, certainly. Years. So we we'll, we we'll just touch on touch on one, which is CBA. It's the bellwether yep. stock. Actually, makes up about twelve percent of our index now. So all passive inflows that are going in and going into that, and you're getting you know, twelve and a half percent of your money into there, sitting in around twenty six times forward earnings. Wow. Um, so if you're paying that amount. Yes, you've got a quality bank, and yes, you've, you've you've got something that will be around for a very long time. Um, but risk return, you've got negative earnings, you've got a dividend yield that's lower than the preference shares that you may be able to obtain, um, and so you've got a really expensive equity. I just I, I, I can't make heads or tails of it when you've got other quality assets at cheaper prices with far greater earnings growth. Um, and so we'll, we'll touch on those a little later as well. Sure. <laughs> um, but on this, you've just uh, we, we think it is a cautious approach as we move further in um, to FY25. Um, all of the earnings growth for FY25 is now gone. Um, yes, I'm talking about a headline now, inclusive of resources, and that big downgrade of resources has pushed everything else down. Um, but to fair value from at least one of the research houses that we have uh, access to, um, they're starting to show some value. Um, we always like to try and keep ourselves honest. So this is what we presented uh, back in March, 2024. Um, so I'll just run through it. We thought inflation was going to start to really, really stay around those current levels. And how are we going to, to capture that? Well, we thought the hybrids and the subordinated debt markets for the financials, so locking in some fixed rates while they were high, was a good idea. Um, we've seen a significant softening of those inflation expectations. So I think that was an excellent um, position to take, um, particularly around locking in some of those fixed debts, fixed rate exposures, um, so subordinated debts, or if you're looking at some of those products. Um, and, and that means that you've, you've captured that. And as interest rates fall down, you, you potentially might see some capital uplift on some of those. So that's, a, I think, a, 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 was a really, really strong point. That, that theme itself is uh, still at play, though. 
Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. There's another page to go. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, we, we were very, very much focused on quality. Um, and so picking on some of those, those areas where you can either get that factor, so a factor of quality, um, so QHAL or QHSM, um, or we started to look at some of what we would say are the higher quality positions and direct own, um, uh, direct companies on our market. So ResMed, REA and West Farmers. Um, outside of that, that small to mid cap, which is QHSM, I think that was a resounding ticket. There's some really, really strong results across all of those. Um, it's hard to give a tick or across to this um, central bank put no longer providing a safety net for investors. Um, basically, that means that because interest rates are high, if, if there was a hiccup, you wouldn't see uh, government support and, and cent sorry, central bank support flooding the markets. Um, we haven't had to see that or not. So I didn't, you know, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a tick there. Um, and I think this one uh, around diversification is, is very, very important as we've, we've really, really hit high levels of equity valuations. And so it, it's not something that shows up short term, but I would say that that is a, a, a definite strategy that we're very, very comfortable with back in March and continue to be. Um, the other one that we, we did have was the AUD hedging. Um, we've seen the Australian dollar move up around about 10%. And so I think that's going to continue. And we, we think that was a, 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 a reasonable call to make back then. Lovely. Um, so to your point, where to from here? Where to from here? Um, a new position or, or a new sort of theme that we've been running around is that as inflation and interest rates start to moderate, also start to fall, um, it's actually going to be a, hopefully a pretty good time for global property. And we say global property more so than what we're getting on the Australian market, just because of that relative valuation with interest, sorry, the, the relative difference in interest rates. We've seen that start to fall through first overseas. So we've moved into some of those um, global REITs, so real estate investment trusts. Um, just on that there, because of the theme of, you know, inflation and interest rates, where do we see that um, leading to the infrastructure space? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, we're actually, uh, watching that quite closely domestically. So if you think around the APAs, the transurbans, um, very, very difficult time. Um, but as that starts to change, as we start to see the domestic interest rate environment start to fall away, I think you will see a relief value in some of those infrastructures and that's starting to look attractive. The reason why we haven't really gone at them too hard has be, is, is, is basically because our interest rates have not moved yet. So we're just starting, and it's been a mixed data. It's not like everything's pointing one direction either. Um, so definitely on a watch. Great. Um, we do think that as interest rates fall, we are looking at a, a very, very similar cohort of stocks. So some quality growth stocks, CSL and ResMed, um, James Hardy thrown in there as well, should really benefit from falling global interest rates as people start to, um, particularly in the US at least, um, look at home ownership, look at start to rebuilds, those type of things should greatly benefit James Hardy. Um, we still really like that quality factor, um, so QHAL. Um, as interest rates fall, the smaller mid-cap market, and if you remember at the very, very beginning, we saw a lot of misses in that small to mid-cap market. Um, we think that that should, that should provide a relief, not only for the companies around their interest costs, because they, they struggle to deal with that relative to say a BHP or a, real, a really big company, um, but it also mean that those valuations that have been so depressed compared to some of those really big end of town stocks, so Microsoft and Google, will start to do a catch up. So QHSM is that quality factor, but just in the smaller mid cap area, um, we're really excited about that. Um, we started in March and we, we continue to hold it and continue to, to, to back that call. Um, where are we negative? Uh, no surprises, I've picked on CBA before, but I do think that that, that financials area is very extended. Um, it's going to be horses for courses. So if you're an income focused investor, you do have three of those four banks paying dividends in November. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult to see real weakness moving into to the, at least for those three um, prior to that prior to that time. Um, but we do think on valuation grounds, we are quite negative on, on, on CBA and, and across our, um, our products, uh, we are relatively underweight, except for in one, one particular product, um, which we'll 
touch on next. Um, we do continue to back the subordinated debt and the capital notes. We think that relative interest rates in those areas look really, really attractive on a risk return profile. Um, you're getting a preference preference share with a higher dividend yield and across almost every single one of those relative to the bank's equities themselves. And then with those subordinated debts, you're locking in six, six and a half percent fixed for, for 10 years, which I think in, in another two, three, four years time um, will be an excellent, excellent uh, risk return trade. We're continuing to hedge. So no, um, no surprises there. Uh, you look at what we've just presented with that Australian dollar, US dollar, we think that that's going to continue to move higher into those mid-70s. And I personally think that you're going to see those roll forward valuations again and again and again over these next two to three years, outside of a major shock, um, I should point that out. Um, and then with that Chinese stimulus that you, that you mentioned, um, with a falling US dollar um, and starting to see that that relative valuation come through in terms of fair values across consensus research. You know, the Woodsides, the White Havens, the Rios and the BHPs, so I think are starting to look attractive. Have we seen any impact on the consumer staples with inquiries at the moment? Uh, we certainly have, yes. <laughs> Highly topical. Um, Coles was at a record high before that. Uh, we saw a special dividend from, from Woolworths prior to. Um, we've seen about six to seven percent knocked off um, the two staples with the uh, price pricing inquiry. I suppose you could call it. Yep. Um, I think investor sentiment uh, will continue uh, to be negative on that. Uh, it does look like it's not going away anytime soon. Um, I do think, though, that um, for both of those, that you do have that stable dividend, and in a in a faltering environment, those staples will. Um, or at least in my view, will we'll form part of portfolios, particularly for those income-focused investors. Um, um, we've been pretty uh, pretty comfortable with the healthcare exposure <coughs> um, calls. The outlook for healthcare is still... I think it's really positive. Uh, uh, so we're talking general terms yeah. um, because there is some areas there that are under pressure um, around those private insurers. But if we think around, I think, three or four different stocks on our market, so if you think around a Cochlear or a CSL or a ResMed, um, I think they're, they're excellent long-term quality companies. Um, two of the three, um, I think, uh, are very, very well-priced. Uh, for the growth that you're getting. Uh, third that we did have, which, which, which was Cochlear, we, we sold on valuation grounds. And it's actually been the, the worst performance since the results. Purely on that, it was a fine result. It just got too expensive. Um, so it's knocked off around about 20% of its um, valuation. It's certainly something that we'll look at again. Uh, I think very, very strong overweight position across um, three of our four uh, products and model uh, that we run uh, is overweight healthcare. Um, Another question I might have around that cost of living analysis at the moment, or, or not analysis, but the struggle with that at the moment with uh, interest rates and, and cash flow. Mm -hmm. If we start to see slight, slightly unwinding of that mm -hmm. with lower inflation, interest rates come off a bit, uh, do we see a pickup in other aspects outside no, of consumer discretionary, consumer discretionary yeah, consumer retail? Discretion. It's an interesting you say that. Uh, we've actually seen a, you know, a bellwether discretionary stock um, have, a, have, a, have a downgrade um, yesterday. Um, so that's Premier Investments. Um, so Schmeagel and those type of those type of brands. Um, Solomon Lou's a, a very, very famous um, CEO and managing director. Um, look, potentially, but I don't think it's quite there yet. You won't actually start to see that 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 increase in consumer confidence and increase in consumer spending before before we would start to look at some of those. Um, I do want to predicate that on if you do have a quality uh, uh, domestic um, discretionary retailer um, and they're doing well, then we'll certainly have a look at it through any sort of cycle. Yep. Mm. I think that probably goes for all assets. Yes. Yeah. Um, Onto our, onto our SMA model updates. Um, so for those that don't know, we, we run three SMAs and one, one ethical model. Um, we've been running them since, two, the three of them since 2010. Uh, and the other um, is 
really for the last three three years, which is the ethical um, uh, model portfolio that we do. Um, we have an investment community that sits on top. So you and myself are on those, and we have another two within our Australian Financial Services Licence that sit within there. And then we have two other external to the AFSL, but still within Vincent's um, members. Um, we like to have con, you know, a roundtable discussion and make sure we don't have any sort of advisor bias that's flowing through into our portfolios. Um, and I think, look, we've been really, really happy with how they've gone. Um, so an income-focused uh, SMA, what we're looking at there is consistency of income and how do we get it? We have mature businesses. We, have, we make sure that we're looking at low financial leverage, so not much debt within them. And, and really predictable type of earnings and consistency in dividend income streams. Uh, we've got the one, two, three, five, and 10 year, and of course, the since inception return. Um, uh, the next one over is our balance model. So we are looking at mid to large size businesses here, predominantly large businesses, so bigger companies. Um, and what we're looking at there is a mix between capital growth, so some higher growth that gets mixed in there, hub, James Hardy would be two two names that spring to mind, Aristocrat Leisure, still really big companies, but um, more focused on those growth. And then that also complements what we're trying to do with some of those commodities or some of those financials. So if you think around a Westpac, you think around a BHP, um, CSLs, the ResMeds, um, this is the sort of balance between a full growth portfolio and an income portfolio. Um, the one, three, five, ten year returns and then the since inception return sits at around about 10% for that. Uh, we have a growth portfolio. This, this obviously, as it sounds, uh, is far more focused on capital growth at the expense of income. So you do tend to find there is some smaller cap stocks in here, so smaller companies. Um, we are looking at large addressable markets, so really trying to take on a little bit of extra risk, a little bit of higher beta than the other two, so beta being volatility, um, and, and, and trying to drive a higher total capital growth return. Um, again, really pleasingly over those one, two, three, five, uh, ten year returns, and then that sits inception returns, sits at around about that 12.5%. Um, we would stress that this is just a model. Uh, this is an in-product form. Uh, we've been running it <clears throat> since uh, around about April 20. Um, this is all around just trying to have a basis for an ethical portfolio for clients to build off. Um, so the one, two and the three year returns are there. Um, it does screen out. So it's a negative screening type model. Um, but of course, what we try and deliver for clients is, is, is a personalised mandate. We try and sit down with them. So this just forms a basis of it. I think that um, the personalised mandate, what you're referring to there, not just on the ethical, um, mm. is actually really across the board. Is mm. I'm saying that those, the, four, the three SMAs or separately managed accounts, they're actively, actually actively managed products and the, the model here, they're all in the Australian Equities Club asset class mm. and so really what it is about is actually just making that bespoke investment strategy based on your objectives the source of funds the investment time frame and you know whether it's income or growth and i think it's just saying well even though it's all australian equities there's a strategy within that to and it's just to one deliver part your of your outcome and that's only one part of you you know extending that into strategic asset allocations across other asset classes as well agree um that's it, guys. So thank you very much.